never underestimate your power as an individual about the changes that you can make and the difference that that can make when you share that story because it just keeps going out and out and out. And that's why Take Three is so successful because that story is now shared in 129 countries and counting. Listen Stokely where we try to be involved To listen and learn for us all to evolve So welcome to you and welcome the world We hope you enjoy the stories to be told Welcome to Stokely, a podcast where we explore environmental conservation, our human mindset and adventure Each week we invite you into a conversation with people from all walks of life people who truly inspire us and set about contributing to a greater place for us all to call home. So please take some time to settle in for a conversation today with our host, Maya. Welcome to the Stokely Podcast. My name is Maya Backhausen and we are on a mission to maintain the art of conversation. I hope you're as inspired and motivated coming out of these conversations as I am and I hope it leads you to start, sit or listen in conversation. We'd like to invite you in joining us to acknowledge the traditional custodians upon the lands where this podcast is created and listened to and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. On this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Sarah Beard, who after a 30 year career working as a producer in film and television production, making content that celebrated our oceans and raise awareness around its decline, has now been appointed the CEO of Take Three for the Sea. Take Three is an incredible movement. Currently, it contributes to the removal of 10 million pieces of rubbish annually. It's got participation in 129 countries and it has educated more than 500,000 people. And for me, what I find most impressive about it is that it clearly shows a huge positive impact that can come from very small efforts from many individuals. And what they say is take three pieces of rubbish with you when you leave the beach, waterway or anywhere and you have made a difference. And if you have a look into the work that they do, it's it really does show how much we can do with just a small action daily. And so Along with hearing more about all of that, we get to hear the story of Sarah's life and how she came to be the CEO of this incredible organisation. And I really want to say thanks, Sarah, for her time and, um, and yeah, being a part of this conversation today because it was amazing. And I really enjoyed it and I'm really stoked that you're here and able to listen to it as well. So let's get into it and thanks for joining in for another episode of Stokely. It is, yeah. the The power of conversation is um is it's become more and more apparent to me that it, it's it's really um, useful in terms of a tool for going forward in the world. And also, it just it, there's something about like it brings people together a little bit more. And and then um, yeah, there's so there's so many good things about it. And I, I also love the little the little bits of awkwardness that come with having to like really kick into a conversation that can be a a little bit more meaningful. Like I really, Mm. I really enjoy that. Not that we're going to have any of those. um, Yeah, you're welcome to. It's good. That's how you, sometimes you have to workshop things. But I think conversation is so much of a, a more of a stronger tool than somebody just delivering a speech. You know, there's got, it's got to be that exploration of an idea. Um, Mm. I know for me, that's why I love working with kids so much is because, you know, they have great ideas. And they've always yeah. got to be listened to. Well, I would love to hear a little bit of like why you believe that. Okay, so um, the reason why I believe so strongly um, in working with with young people with kids is because uh, kids are the future um, caretakers of this beautiful blue marble that we all live on and um, not only are they the future caretakers but I think uh, the younger generations of today are incredibly passionate and interested in about um, environmental issues and conservation issues 
but they're also incredibly frustrated by it. And so at Take Three, we're very passionate about uh, listening to young people's ideas. Um, you know, they can't vote. Uh, they want to be part of a conversation and they're often left out of a conversation. And it's really important um, to, uh, to us at Take Three to give young people opportunities for leadership to learn leadership skills so that they can go out there in the world and be advocates for what they believe in, um, but also hear what they've got to say and, and, and listen to their frustrations. You know, there's, there's a lot of them are pretty angry about the decisions that are being made around them. I mean, you know, right, it's all right, red hot right now with, you know, COP26 going on um, in Glasgow. There's uh, young people are angry about the decisions that are being made by our leaders about the, their planet that they live on and uh, it's incredibly important that we listen to them, we hear them and we also give them opportunities um, to participate uh, in the solutions and give them the opportunities uh, and inspire them to take action. You know, they're awesome, awesome kids. They've just got so much energy um, for conservation and for the environment. Yeah, and absolutely. Privileged. And, you know, like at the same time it's it's, like they're they're helping everyone out. They're not just helping themselves out in their own. Like, hopefully, you know. Obviously, no one knows when it's out when our time's up on this amazing um, planet. But yeah, you know, it's going to be a, a much more pleasant existence if we're if we're all on the same um, same bandwagon. I think you know, for, especially when it comes to the environment and the natural world, um, because I don't I don't think. The research says that humans are not going to do too well if the natural world ceases to exist. So, um, so yeah. yeah, that's absolutely right, and, and that's one of the key messages um, that we talk about. We take three, and we talk about in the education programs, and it was certainly um, a key message that came out of the film um, that I made called Blue, and that few people really understand uh, the role of the ocean, and that. You know, the reason why I refer to it as, as this blue marble or um, it's it's called, uh, you know, we call it planet ocean is because over 70% of the uh, planet is covered by ocean, as we know. But the ocean drives our climate, it drives our weather, it provides more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe, that absorbs more carbon than the rainforest. People just don't get what the ocean does for us, let alone supplying food, and yet we are continuing to use it as a commodity um, and we continue to trash it and if we don't you know take care of our ocean it actually uh, will become a, a great challenge for humans to continue surviving on this planet yeah it's I don't you know I've only really become aware of the significance of the ocean and, and the role that it plays um, in terms of the effects that it has on all the land that we have and, you know, mm. where people essentially live. But, yeah, that documentary blue that you created is like a little, it's it's hard to watch in many regards because it's just so, um, it's so confronting with the amount of information and also like, hard, yeah, hard to swallow information about what's going on with regards to the ocean. So, like, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, creating that documentary? Because that, from the outside looking in, seems like an incredible piece of work and must have taken a lot of time and effort to bring that together. Sure, um, absolutely. So uh, back in 2015, um, myself and a very good friend but also a long-term colleague of mine, Karina Holden, who's the film's director and also a co-producer, uh, we've made quite a number of um, documentaries for television together. And it was when in 2015 WWF put out a report um, and, and we hear it all the time now that by 2050 there'll be more plastic uh, in the ocean than fish. And that would also, um, by at, at that point in 2015, we'd lost over 40% of our marine biodiversity, so over 40% of the species in the ocean had already been lost. And that was a that was a pretty big blow and a, and a full on um, thing to hear. So we felt compelled to to do something about it. And, and our um, skill set and, and what we did was storytelling. And so we felt we needed to to make a film. Um, and that's where we we came up with the idea of blue. Now, 
at the time there was also a lot taking place with whether or not to protect, um, to give the Great Barrier Reef its full protection um, at, by the United Nations. And at the time it was, it was uh, knocked back uh, as it has again <laughs> been done recently. So we had to decide, do we make a film just about the Great Barrier Reef and, and climate change or do we make a film about all the impacts that are taking place on the ocean? And we made the decision on the latter to make a film about all the impacts that are taking place in the ocean because we feel it's very much, um, every it's like a domino effect, you know, one thing affects the other thing and you need to look at it like we do a whole planet. We're all part of a biosphere. So everything that happens here affects there. So every action that we have as humans affects the whole of life on this earth. So we wanted to make a film about what humans are doing to the ocean and what that would mean. Why does it matter? Why does it matter if we um, don't protect our oceans? But there's a lot <laughs> in the storytelling. So, you know, we we chose to make a film that um, didn't really dig deep. You can't do that in a space of 76 minutes, which was the which was the length of the of the feature film. So what was more important to us was to just really, I guess, in some respects, skim across the surface um, and do in doing so using who we call our ocean guardians, so people who have um, dedicated their life to protecting the ocean in, in different areas. And just it was more about taking the audience on an emotional journey to show them this is what's going on, um, but you can be inspired, like these are just normal people um, that have taken action. We can't all take, you know, we can't all drop everything and give up our lives to do this, um, but there's certain actions that you can take as individuals um, that will help um, address and mitigate the problems. So it was more a piece about in, uh, raising awareness about the problem, as we do with Take 3, um, taking people on that emotional journey so they, like Karina and I, had been felt compelled to do something. So the important thing was at the end of the film, having kind of, you know, I always say bring people down to like the real depths of like, wow, you know, we are just doing so much damage. We had to bring people back up again. So the end of the film becomes that more that inspiration or that motivational piece of there is still hope. Like all of these people who are constantly seeing it every day, they still have hope um, and there's this belief in, in human beings to be able to turn things around for the for the good of the ocean. But with with films like Blue, it's not just making the film itself. We also ran a three-year impact or outreach campaign. So the film has been in multiple festivals, like hundreds of festivals um, all around the world. And, you know, after each screening, um, there's often Q&As uh, where we can talk to the audience about what they can do. And we developed lots of resources around, well, you could take small actions or medium-sized actions or bigger actions. So it's what we call an impact film. Um, and, you know, documentaries since day dot have always been telling stories about things and wanting people to feel moved by it, to want to do something or to respond in somehow. Now we use the, the coined phrase impact film. So you make a film to raise awareness, you tell a story to educate, raise awareness and to inspire action. And that's really also the essence of what Take 3 is all about. It's um, education, whether it's education with kids, whether it's education and community, whether it's education with businesses. It's telling a story about what's going on but inspiring people that to participate in the solution. Um, we believe that Take 3 believes in simple actions to address complex problems. So it's telling the story, what's going on, but the great news is, is you can be part of the solution by the actions that you take. And that's really the same kind of reason why we made Blue and it's the same reason why Take 3 exists. I think that speaks a lot to, yeah, that just that human human emotion and, like, mm. you know, every, everyone does essentially at the very, very end of the day want to do something positive if they can, you'd hope. But it, it definitely shows through with most humans, you know, which is, which is good. Yeah, look, I, I generally have that belief. I mean, you know, I've been in, this, in the conservation space for a long time now and, you know, believe me, there are days 
Um, I mean, particularly at the moment where I see some of the decisions that are being made here in Australia and our own country about um, how, how to to tackle climate change. But I do, because of, of the majority of people uh, do want to, you know, it's not just um, uh, what people would like to refer to as greenies. I believe in the majority of people want to protect the environment. The majority of people want to see a healthy planet, not just for their own uh, life and, and their own quality of life and the future of their children, but because, you know, people don't want to see, uh, you know, wildlife being impacted. They don't want to see beautiful environments destroyed. I mean, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the world love David Attenborough and everything that he stands for and, you know, will do anything to try and um, repair the damage that he has seen done. Mm. You know, I, I do believe in... I do believe in the human ability to turn this around. Yeah. Well, that's great to hear because you've seen, <laughs> you've seen a lot of it. You ask me on yeah. a good day. You ask yeah. me on a good day. So, <laughs> some days, you know, some days when I go down to the beach and I still see so much litter on the beach yeah. at a very basic level, it's like, you know, people still litter. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I do just think you know, seriously. Yeah. So you got me on a good day. Some days I might not be <laughs> so generous <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, and so I would love to know how you um, first got into, because um, right now you're the CEO of Take3, um, but prior to that, um, if I've got this correct, it was kind of filmmaking was your main thing, right? Yeah. And then, and then so... I would love to know how you first got into um, filmmaking and conservation in that, in that space and and if there was anything when you were younger that that was like the, the triggering forces behind um, you getting into that space as you grew up. Sure. Um, well, I'd like to tell a story. Uh, I have always been... Um, a conservationist in my heart, even as a little girl. So when I was aged, I think I was around six, um, you know, I grew up in a household full of pets and animals, um, but I uh, joined up with an organisation called the Gerald Durrell Club, which was um, called the Dodo Club out of um, the United Kingdom. And that was a, a club which was about uh, protecting um, species from becoming extinct, hence the dodo. The dodo had been extinct. And I was really passionate about that as, as a young kid and so much so that I um, got a, a, a posse together of my friends and formed my own club called the Animal Club and had folders called Animal Club. And we, um, we went around the streets and we uh, raised money um, and put our own pocket money, and I think we sent like probably the equivalent of fifty dollars a year over to the Gerald Durrell Club. So I, I've always, it's always been a part of who I am. I think it came from my family of, of being animal lovers. Um, but as a young age, I was pretty serious um, and already was aware of um, of species becoming extinct and, and conservation issues. Um, I've done a lot of travelling, um, spent a lot of time in the Pacific where I'd seen a lot of uh, litter and waste, plastic pollution in our environment. I've always had a, a, a bee in my bonnet about um, litter on the streets, litter in the beach. I have been known to um, very gently give people back their litter through their car windows if I see them throw it out. <laughs> so good. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, you know, grew up wanting to be a photographer for National Geographic uh, and along the way after university I met some documentary filmmakers when I was living uh, in Spain actually um, and really loved what they were doing, which was telling stories um, about what they saw was going on in the world and, and they um, mostly told conservation stories. So that's kind of how I, I fell in love with documentary filmmaking um, and really came back to Australia and uh, did a little bit of further study and then moved into that space. So uh, for the last 25 years, um, I worked my way up through the film industry, mostly making documentary films. Um, and a lot of them have been around, um, in and around the ocean stories, which has been fantastic. Um, you know, I'm an ocean girl from way back when. Um, but what was, what, 
how I kind of connected with Take Three in the end was actually through a film. So uh, back in 2013, I think it was, I saw a, a short for a film um, about the um, impacts of plastic on the North Pacific albatross. It was a film at the time was called Midway. And you, the film starts off, you know, you're seeing this incredible beauty of these beautiful uh, North Pacific albatross soaring in the sky. And then you focus on the island. As you pull out, <clears throat> you can see that pretty well 100% of, of the seabird chicks have been impacted by plastics and there's dead birds, everybody. And I literally, it sounds dramatic, but I fell to the floor in tears and um, couldn't believe it. It was the first time I'd been witnessed and seen the impacts of plastic pollution you know that was back in 2013-14 where it still wasn't really all that well known and because of what I saw like what I was saying before I saw it I felt compelled to do something about it you know I was so emotionally moved and so overwhelmed so I sought out an organization in my local community that was doing something about it um, and that happened to be take three um, and um I offered, you know, I kind of approached them and said, I'd like to work for you as a volunteer and uh, these are my skills, you know, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, but I also at the time was quite involved in surf lifesaving and they happened to um, have just got some uh, a grant to uh, run that project. So I launched and ran um, the Take Three Surf Lifesaving Clubs project, which is essentially educating uh, nippers, you know, young Australian surf divers and their families about the impacts of plastic pollution and doing beach cleanups and surf clubs. And I ran that for, for a few years um, in as a, as a sideline, um, mostly as a volunteer um, to my film work. And then I also served on the board um, at Take Three for a little while as well. Uh, in the end, I had to sort of pull back on that because I got too busy with Blue. But um, when my, my predecessor, the fabulous Silverwood, who was the previous CEO of Take Three and one of our founders, who also featured in my film Blue, um, he he stood down to to go and start a new venture, um, and they approached me and asked if I would consider being the CEO, which was a big jump for me. You know, I, I had a twenty five year career in, in the film industry, but I was so the reason why I made that choice is I'd been so inspired by seeing the power of grassroots response and action through the blue impact campaign and seeing how you tell people what's going on and you inspire them to take action you provide them with things that they can do uh, then you can achieve so much and so being inspired by the power of grassroots action and and audiences wanting to do something and be involved and participate and be part of a movement. Um, all of those things inspired me to say, yep, I'm going to jump ship and join the uh, not-for-profit sector uh, and, and drive the ship at Take Three because I loved what they do. You know, they, you know, Take Three started as, as a grassroots, um, very local organisation uh, nearly 12 years ago now um, by the three founders. And they started it because they saw, you know, they're very ahead of their time. They saw what was going on in with plastic pollution. They wanted to do something about it. And they started it just on the central coast of New South Wales and it's now followed in 129 countries around the world. Um, and it's 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 got that reach because people care about it and people want to be involved. So in 129 countries around the world, people are taking three for the sea. So good. What an amazing story. So stoked. <laughs> kind of went on a bit. I was just making sure you were still awake there. <laughs> no, uh, no, this is what it's all about, storytelling. It's so um, I just feel like, you know, I'd, I'd love to ask you because the title of CEO, you know, it can, like, what is, I know what it means on paper and I know what, you know, you've got responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. But I just feel like at the same time, you know, it's um, that that all is is also seen very differently by people that are in that role. And, and you know, not many people in the world are CEOs. And and I suppose it leads me to asking you, what, is, what does that mean for you? You know, you went from um, a career for 25 years, filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, and you said you made this jump. Like, how do you make a jump like that? And and what does it what does it mean to be a CEO? 
um, especially mm. for, for, you know, like you said, the non-for-profit sector, but also for something that, yeah, really does drive a lot of, a lot of positive change, a lot of positive change. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I, and I think being a, C- a CEO of a not-for-profit is very different from being a CEO of a multinational, obviously. For me, um, yes, on paper it means a whole bunch of things. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for the financial stability of the organisation. But for me, being the CEO of Take3 is, is being very much, um, I guess, part of the trunk that supports and enables the rest of the organisation to be the trees and the branches to reach out around the world to inspire people to take action. And, and you know, recently I've been working, um, I'm lucky enough as a, as a CEO of a, of a charity, uh, I'm very lucky enough to have people that give their time to me in the coaching space as an executive coach or a personal coach they give up their time because they want to invest time in in somebody they feel is making a difference and I realized for me the way that I want to spend life it 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 needs to my top value is making a contribution and having and and having a life of purpose Um, so for me being in this role it ticks that most important value of mine, which is to live a life um, where I believe my everyday work life is making a contribution. And I, I can honestly say I don't say that with any ego. I don't say that um, with any arrogance. I am, I'm a really humble person. Um, but uh, it, it's a lot of work, a lot of work you do um, that you're not paid for. Um, but the reward very much is uh, knowing that the impact that you potentially are having. And I think <clears throat> there's days where I get kind of, um, I, I do get tired and I get overworked, but then I read, for example, our Take 3 Global Facebook and I'll spend a Saturday morning having my coffee and just reading through the comments from all over the world, like the most obscure places where people are picking up litter and posting a picture of what they've picked up and what Take 3 means for them. And when I read those simple messages, that is what being a CEO of Take 3 is about, that I know that I'm connected to a world, a global movement full of people who feel exactly the same way that I do they, they can't stand seeing what they're seeing taking place and they want to do something about it and that needs to be a part of their everyday life. So for me, that's what being a CEO is about. It's about enabling this organisation, supporting my team um, to be the branches um, but to feel... Um, very connected to a global movement of people that feel the same way that I do, that we we want to spend our time just taking small actions that will collectively make a huge difference. Yeah. Beautiful. That, you, you've, that sounds so, uh, I, I feel like, have you done work and what, what work have you done to understand the values that are, that's most important to you? You said contribution there. I feel like, I feel like maybe, you know, you've gone through somewhat of a process to really actually uncover what that is. Is it, did you? And, and what was that? Well, not, not, uh, it's interesting. It's a very recent thing for me. Um, I've, I'm, as a, as a person, I've always kept myself very busy. I haven't really spent a lot of time um, in self-evaluation. I'm, I'm quite a, um, a gut feeling kind of girl. So uh, I'm dangerously a yes person. So something interests me or I'm curious about, or I feel passionate about, I'll say yes. And then all of a sudden I've got five million things on my slate. Um, So I recently made the decision that I actually needed to take stock about where I was going, what I was doing. Um, And then the next step for me was, hang on a minute, I don't think I know myself as well as I would like to because I've never really done much self-reflection. I've been very much just doing what feels 
important and right to me at the time. So upon self-reflection, I literally, I, I went through this, this great book, actually. It's called um, Think, Plan, Live by Jill McLaren, wow. and, um, who's one of our board members. Highly recommend it. Um, and it's about um, living your best life and defining what that's going to be. Um, and part of that process was to go through a list of values. And the hilarious thing was, um, which I had to come back to time and time again, is it's a very long list of values. And um, Jill defines values as not, you know, when we think of values, we think of honesty, integrity, um, loyalty. They are all values. But Jill also defines values as the things that we're not prepared to take off the table, the things that we don't think we could live without, the things that when we get to the end of our life, if we haven't done those things, um, then we haven't lived true to our values. Um, and one of the things on the list was, um, was you know, was, was purpose and, and um making that contribution and for me that's you know even as a little girl I always I'm, I'm not a person that just wants to live a life so that I can have a big house and have had lots of friends and all that kind of stuff which are still important you know have friendships are obviously important values for me you know I want to feel when I you know, I always say when I'm a 99-year-old or hopefully over a 100-year-old lady sitting on my back porch, I want to look back and feel that my life has, in my lifetime, made a contribution. And that's not like I would say the majority of people I know feel that. You know, it's uh, there's few people that want to just go through and take, 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 take. So it's not like I'm a saint or anything in saying that. But it is a very, very, very strong, in fact, it's a driving value for me. It's what gets me out of bed it's how I want to spend my work life um I can't spend so much time doing something if it's not making contribution and and even more detail um my specific contribution um for me is towards um conservation and protecting the environment yeah um, to, to nail it down uh you know I, I can't walk through my day and feel that I'm not putting everything I've am into that yeah unreal and but you know in, interesting equally on that list was travel which i felt very nervous about putting down as a value because you know it didn't feel like a a genuine um acceptable value it felt a little bit you know um self-indulgent but it is it's a really uh, i think connecting with rest of world and it's not travel to stay in you know five star hotels all around the world and go shopping down the champs elysees it's about uh connecting with other human beings uh, other cultures um seeing the incredible natural world um but all in, in those traveling it's always about well how can i have that connection and how can I uh, make a contribution there. Mm. So they all your values become interconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you, have you, you know, grow, growing up and even now, have you, do you uh, look up to certain people that you, um, I guess, let's say idolise, but who have you seen as, a, as an incredible role model for, for achieving what you want to achieve? Well, I mean, I think because of my particular interests, um, it's not I want to be them, but they inspire me. Um, and they're, they're all there, you know, the uh, gorgeous older generation of, of conservationists, which would be, you know, of course, David Attenborough. Um, and then in the ocean sector would be uh, Valerie Taylor here in Australia um, and Sylvia Earle, who, you know, um, is is you know great American ocean conservationist the greatest, um, and um, also Jane Goodall of course. So it's, it's interesting because they're all you know a much older generation, but they what I like about them is they are um, they are gentle types. You know they're not out there um, going crazy, but they are just resilient. And they are so 
sure about what they believe in. They're so sure about what needs to happen. Um, they can also tell that story of the change that they've seen. Um, and they, they're they true inspirers of many, many people, you know, much more than, than just me, of what we need to protect. You know, and their story is about it's not just all the bad stuff. It's about, you know, this is all the incredible biodiversity. This is all the incredible planet that we've seen that's still there that we need to celebrate, um, but we need to protect it and this is what we need to do. Um, so, yeah, I would say they're the people that I've grown up reading, you know, reading their books, watching their films, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, and, and I guess in the younger generation, you some, some of the young climate activists that we're seeing as well, you know, they inspire me. And they inspire me because, um, you know, even, you know, she's, she's well-known and famous, but, you know, with Greta, I think she's doing an amazing extraordinary job because she's making young people um, feel that there's somebody fighting the battle and it also makes young people feel that they can they they have a voice they have power and we you know take three earlier this year in June we held um, a youth summit um, it was a two-day youth leadership summit held at Taronga Zoo and it was run by uh, young leaders and all of majority of the guest speakers were young conservation leaders, uh, either in the plastic space or in the climate change space. Um, and we also ran a whole day of, you know, workshops and, and all of the young leaders that went there, which was over 150, um, got to then create and are currently implementing their own projects. And so back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, um, I'm really inspired by young leaders and it is incredibly important to me personally and to take three as an organisation to um, tell the stories of these young leaders and give opportunities for more young leaders to, to grow and grow their skill set and, and get their stories out there because they're equally as inspiring to me as, as the older generation of leaders who have been advocating for this for a very long time. Yeah. I, I love how you described the um, that, I guess, older generation, how they're just, they, they've got like a sense of calm about them when they, yeah. when they talk and stuff. And you're like, it's almost, it kind of can, I feel like it, it, um, it kind of moves you a bit to think, hang on, like they they know something that we don't. Like, why are they so calm in the face of this like atrocity with what's going on and how much they've had to witness being lost? And you're like, but that is just like a true quality that is just so I don't know. It's, there's something about it. I, I can't really put my finger on it, but it's just like it's so it's so. Uh, um, I guess it's like yeah, it's just just allows you to be like, oh, actually, maybe maybe if we do a lot of these things, we are going to be okay, you know, like it's, it might be all right. Yeah, but I think it's also too like what we were talking about at the very beginning of, um, of our conversation today was the art of conversation. So, I mean, look, there's so many different ways you can campaign about important issues and, you know, potentially for some there is a need and a desire to, to rattle the chains and, and um, you know, almost potentially, you know, be angry and, and confrontational. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily seem to get anywhere. And I think, you know, we can all, you know, Mr Attenborough is out there as we speak in, in, in Glasgow and, he, you know, he when he walks onto that stage, I mean, he, like he's 97 so he's not exactly going to be uh, <clears throat> roaring around too much but, you know, people listen. The world stops to listen to what he's got to say because he is well informed he is knowledgeable um, and I think that's really an important thing is to make sure you're incredibly well informed you're up to date because things change all the time um, and that's why I think science you know I, I really um, advocate for the importance of science and research and that we need to put money into science and research because to win these conservation battles, to, to know how to protect things, we need to understand it. You know, a, a species that's very close to my heart, 
which was another film that I made actually after Blue, um, is a, a beautiful film called Sea Lions Life by a Whisker, which played, is currently playing in IMAX theatres around the world, but also played in Melbourne IMAX. And that's about the, the, the fate of the Australian sea lion. Now, you know, we made this film because uh, if we don't stop the decline of the species, they could be extinct within 25 years. We made this film because very few Australians are actually aware that we have our own endemic sea lion. So people think, oh, we see seal seals all the time around our coastlines and seals are okay. But the Australian sea lion is just endemic to the South Australian and the South Western Australian coasts. And they are in a massive decline. There are only 10 to 12,000 species left. There's no money going towards um, research and, and understanding why. Like we know it is human impact in all, you know, whether it's commercial fishing, it's climate change, it's plastics. They're also an incredibly vulnerable species <clears throat> because they, um, their um, breeding is quite um, complex and they don't breed that often. Um, but they're one of the most endangered um, mammals on the planet, that's the not just sea lions in general. The Australian sea lion is one of the most endangered mammals on the planet, and very few people know about them because they live in these islands. And, and you know, the thing about the Australian sea lion is just got to be about the cutest you know thing in the water that you'll ever see. They're you know they're the pups of the ocean. They're incredibly amazing animals but they're also um their pillar they, they show us the state of the ocean health the reason why i'm telling that story is um we need to understand what's going on we need to invest in science and research we need to support that so that we have an informed approach it's not just about you know jumping up and down it's about a calm informed process because it's big stuff we're talking about you know it's it's the future of the planet um mm. and as as mr attenborough always says you know the biodiversity is just it's going very quickly yeah it's um the rapid decline is incredible oh mm. makes me sick it is incredible and that's why it's got to be fought across all fronts and by all people you know mm. um and and as we were saying at the beginning um i really want to say to everybody that believe me, even if you take the smallest actions, make the smallest individual changes in your life, that will make a difference. And share your story, share those changes, share why you're doing it and inspire others to do it. You know, it's, it's a, a, a great story. One of our Take Three ambassadors, Lizzie Wellborn, who's an Australian champion um, iron woman in surf lifesaving, you know, she found out about Take Three probably four or five years ago now. Um, and uh, she's in East, lives, was living in the sort of Bondi area, found out about Take Three, took the message home to her family. And so the whole family started, you know, picking up rubbish from the beach but also eliminating single-use plastics in the family home. And then she said, shared that story with her friends why she was doing it and she inspired them to do the same. And then she shared that story with her surf club community uh, and why she was doing it and they started doing it and you know then it goes out and out it's that ripple effect it's the multiplication effect so never underestimate your power as an individual about the changes that you can make and the difference that that can make when you share that story because it just keeps going out and out and out and that's why take three is so successful because that story is now shared in 129 countries and counting mm. yeah absolutely i'd like to you mentioned the word earlier on before um resilience and being some like you know being in the conservation space and um having the opportunity to work with you know people that have been in this space for decades and, and people that are new to it, I quite often hear about, you know, the the need to be aware of the burnout that can be associated with this space and being so engaged, emotionally engaged in these topics and these causes. And I guess what I'd like to know is how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you, like 
manage the resilience that you need to have in in this space and i and i suppose also to add to that you must have seen so much doing documentary filmmaking you must have seen a lot and and viewed it so closely through the lens of a camera um and you know spoken to people um with the stories that are no doubt very um you know emotional in many ways as well and how do you or how do you manage that in in your own life in your role um in just in this world yeah absolutely um you do need to be resilient um, in the in the conservation space um and there has been many times where i have felt overwhelmed and um and i have lost hope and i have felt um depleted of energy um but what brings me back from that it's it's actually pretty easy um it would be reconnecting with nature so i do a lot of ocean swimming uh so i i pretty well swim every day so once i'm out there um in the ocean uh that instantly changes my mood and makes me feel more positive and there's a lot of science behind that um or i will equally so you know be out in the, in in the trees uh anywhere in nature where i can see its beauty it has a physiological and psychological positive impact on me yes but it also remotivates me as to why i'm doing it so that's that that connection with nature and the seeing of nature and the beauty of nature and what's at stake and then the second thing is um other people being inspired by other people as i shared before you know there's this i might get to the end of of a big week and i still you know see so much litter on the beaches and i just think oh you know seriously when is this going to change or i still see people walking around with their you know throw away um you know plastic items but then i read the stories you know i read the stories on our take 3 global um facebook page about all the people who are trying to do something or who are doing things so i am reinvigorated i am reinspired i am remotivated that there's more people out there um doing the right thing and wanting to see the change than there's not and there's a lot of people out there who who want to do something you know i, th- I think for me one of the most um lowest moment i've had in terms of seeing stuff is the uh and it's you know see it all over social media see shepherd report on it a lot is the big um it's not even a cull <laughs> it's a um uh, it's a murderous scene of when up in the farallon islands up in denmark where they uh kill hundreds of whales and thousands of dolphins <clears throat> essentially for sport for tradition and seeing those waters uh so full of blood and so full of dead animals in the most brutal and violent and hideous way just about knocks me beyond being able to come back you know i just i can't i cannot fathom it i cannot fathom why human beings can do that and there's many things that we as humans do which a uh, equally is bad um the only way i can come back from that is is seeing the sheer beauty seeing many of my colleagues in the film industry um recording such extraordinary things with the camera you know beyond belief extraordinary things we see in nature living creatures and how much is still there and that brings me back that makes me feel positive and reading the stories of other people just like me who want to do something about it and there's a huge movement out there you know it's not just take 3 there's lots of young people there's lots of middle-aged people there's lots of old people that are out there in force trying to stop it and make a difference and you can't give up 
you know, I, I do believe. And, and I've seen the change, you know, like when I first got involved in Take 3 back in 2013, 14, people didn't know about plastic bags in the ocean. People didn't know that single-use plastics were a bad idea. And since then, I've seen it's, uh, it is absolutely the forefront of global conversation. Very few people, you would be hard-pressed coming across somebody who doesn't know about the impacts on plastic pollution. So I've seen change, you know. Uh, I've seen world leaders in, in countries that you wouldn't expect, it, like Morocco and, and the island of Bali and these obs- these countries, many third world countries that are actually doing more about plastic pollution than we are here in Australia. So it's reading those stories, seeing that change has happened. You know, the change that's happened in the plastic space in the last five or six years is mind-blowing, you know, that you can have these conversations and people know what you're talking about. People know that we have a plastic crisis facing our oceans and people are, are, are responding, you know, people are giving up. We've got big companies, big multinationals changing the way they package their materials. We've got our own government here in Australia um, have a national plastics plan that they're trying to roll out, you know. Things are being banned. And that's just in the last five years. So that's why I have hope because it's happening. Yeah. It might not be happening quickly, but it's happening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the the slow burn of the change is uh, it can seem pretty uh, snail pace sometimes. But um, oh, I hope it. Maybe it will get to a point where it's it's you know like a critical mass where it's just like oh, hang on a sec, we've all got to move on this. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, well, I, I just think it's just it's and and things change so quickly too. It's all about education and it's about. In some respects, you have to connect it to humans because, you know, not all, a lot of humans are just sort of focused on their own well-being and their own life. Um, but I think it's back to what I was saying about blue. It's, you know, as a species, we have emotion. We respond to things that we see. We respond to things that we hear. So if you're telling those stories, I'm so passionate about storytelling. Um, if we tell those stories, engage humans at a basic level um and then they will feel like i have been like you are by you know reaching out to me you feel compelled to tell stories you feel compelled to change mm-hmm. yeah absolutely so a little uh, you know um so we so we, i want to i want to end on that hope um <laughs> as as you know we spoke about it the title the what what do you have in terms of like your vision and, and your greatest hopes for take three? Do you and do you also kind of lead the organization with with that? You know, do you have your own personal kind of vision of of some I don't you know like an end an end goal, but do you have some things that you really want to see come to life in, um, whilst you're in the position you're in? And also, you know, maybe set it up for, um, you know, the organisation to to take it from from where you leave it. Yeah, absolutely. So my vision for Take Three um, is to really increase our what I call our cultural and our geographical impact. And what I mean by that is, I've said that you know, Take Three is followed in 129 countries, and we are, but I want to see uh, us actually having on-the-ground projects, uh, both education um, and community projects actually having on-the-ground impact there. So we're running those, um, what I call our footprint. I'm very passionate about... um, taking take three upstream and this was this was um an idea i met an ideas person (laughs) as well as a numbers person um and there's a a great project that we're developing calling um saltwater to freshwater taking take three upstream and what that's all about is i was um lucky enough to be listening to a, a great local indigenous storyteller and teacher um that we were filming for some of our online curricula and he's a saltwater man 
and he was telling his bloodline is, is saltwater people and he was telling us um as we were filming this story about saltwater people believe that the the oceans like the beating heart of the planet and the rivers are the arteries and like you know i've grown up in a culture that thinks about the rivers feeding the ocean whereas his storytelling was that the ocean feeds the rivers it goes the other way and that the saltwater people actually um, sing a song to the freshwater people about the role of the ocean and about coming up river so I was just like listening to this thinking oh my god this is such a great story um, I felt very inspired by it but it, what it made me think and we were talking all about this connection piece and you know, as I was saying earlier in our conversation today about the role of the ocean and, you know, personally and at Take 3, we believe that and we know we are all connected to the ocean. So whether you're a coastal dweller, a rural dweller, a remote dweller, um, wherever you live on the planet, you are connected to the ocean because it is the most important life force of our planet. A lot of ocean conservation work is done on the coast. That's where the majority of people live. Um, and it kind of feels like you're making, you know, you're working on beaches connected to the ocean. Um, but I'm very passionate about taking our organisation up river and working in taking the same message about connection um, to the ocean, about protecting the ocean uh, to people who live in rural Australia and rural communities around the world and remote communities, particularly around rivers, because as as we know, you know, rivers, uh, you know, 80% of, of the plastic pollution in our ocean comes from the land and the rivers and the drains are the pools through which that rubbish travels. So for me, my vision for Take 3 um, is expanding our actual on-the-ground footprint um, more globally, but in the in the near future to a more national footprint, but also a regional footprint. I'm very passionate about working uh, in with our regional neighbours in the Pacific. I was born in Fiji. I, I've lived a long time over the various years in Fiji, um, and I uh, and there's a lot going on in the Pacific already. Um, but also, as I was saying, working inland with inland communities, and luckily. Um, the rest of my team are uh, equally passionate about um, that vision for Take 3, about taking our programs upstream and working in inland communities. Um, but I'm also passionate in uh, working a lot more with business. So a lot of people think about Take 3 for the Sea is just about picking up rubbish from the beaches. Um, but we've always advocated for litter prevention and waste reduction. Um, and we're also advocating for, you know, what we, what's a, a coin term that's being thrown around a lot, turning off the tap. So, you know, we don't want to just be an organisation that's picking up litter from the beach or removing it from the ocean or educating people about doing that and the problem. We also uh, firmly believe in how we can work with business to um, stop the use of virgin plastics. You know, we can't completely get rid of plastic, unfortunately, um, but we can um, advocate for all business and all of us to, to work with the circular economy. So reusing, uh, repurposing, recycling. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done in recycling, as we know, um, but again, those changes are happening. So, uh, you know, my vision for Take 3 is to also be working with businesses, um, to, to, to work with all, um, all parts of the supply chain. You know, for, for a Take 3 to be successful, we have to stop the plastic pollution problem and that's not just removing it. At, at this end, it's about how we can uh, stop our reliance on it, stop our obsession with plastic, um, how we can be smarter and that's designing, supporting companies that are designing solutions so that we don't have to just continuously be making plastic. And, you know, unfortunately, <clears throat> one of the downsides of, um, of reusable energy, um, i.e., um, you know, solar panels and things like that, and, and having electric cars, which is 
all a must and it has to, all of the petrochemical companies are now putting enormous amounts of pressure on the plastics production companies to use their oil to make virgin plastic because they see a future of everyone driving electric cars, so they're, they're pivoting. And um, Take Three's just recently um, developed and, and run a pilot on a program called uh, Plastics Equals Climate because, in fact, the, the whole plastics industry from extraction through to degradation um, is having a massive, massive, massive effect on climate in terms of the amount of CO2s that are produced from the, produce, from the production. So, you know, that's where I see Take Three as well. You know, our role isn't just inspiring people to um, pick up rubbish, remove it, or stop using single-use plastics. It's, it's also to inspire people, and we have tremendous powers um, as um, as individuals. To to we have the power to shop with our you know wallets and and, and choose people that uh, choose products and choose businesses that are trying to mitigate the plastic pollution crisis. Mm. Absolutely. I I did hear that, that um, like the, I guess, kind of, you know, fossil fuel, oil and gas companies mainly, like the plastics industry is their like final pillar of support yeah. for their business model in terms of extraction and and using that um, that resource, which, you know, just didn't occur to me a couple of years ago. But hearing that, it's like, whoa, they must... Yeah, they must like be using it, um, like you say, to to kind of as a as a final avenue for what they pull out of the ground. Like they've they they can't just store it forever. They've just got to send it somewhere. Which, mm. um, yeah, well, that's that's heavy. When you yeah, think it's pretty of- scary. We're, we're re- we've actually got a, a survey which you might want to share with everybody um, afterwards, which is the Plastic Equal Climate Survey, and it's a, exactly taking people through that process. So you know, we've come across. Um, people at the leading edge of business that weren't even aware that, that plastics made from petrochemicals, um, you know, but they, 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 again, always wanting to put hope and not mm. a positive edge is there, is there are so many people now working in this space. So there's you know, big um, uh, organisations, big not-for-profits that are also doing the whole uh, research into the uh, Im- impacts on human health. I mean, you know, when we're using plastics, uh, you know, people are heating up their food in plastic containers and things. I mean, that the leakage of of um, chemicals into us is obscene, and you know that's what. The, and this is why you need to be well informed, um, because there's new stuff coming out all the time in terms of, you know, recently reports coming out about the amount of of plastics being found in the placenta um, of of babies being born and developed and that there's you know recently we we published it in our social media a report that came out that there's more plastics in babies poo um than in adults so you know these newborn these wee babies there are so much plastics that we are you know there's plastics microplastics tiny plastics in our, the air that we breathe and the water that we drink you know people of course are um, wearing nylon clothing and as you you know there's so many areas where it's entering us and entering the little stream you know people who aren't using um you know cottons and natural fibers in their clothing every time you wash it's all those microfibers going out into the ocean so again <clears throat> you do start to go oh my god it's so big it's so huge how can we stop this uh, and you just have to you have to you know it's a very big mountain a very big mountain of litter that we look at um as potential, and you just have to break it down to actions that we can all take and, again, multiplying that out. And if these small changes each of us make um, and, you know, again, if you use less plastic, then you're making a contribution to less CO2s. This program that we did with kids is great. The kids had to run around and collect the amount of plastic they had, you know, single-use plastic items, plastic bottles, plastic sauce bottles, et cetera. They had in their house, they had to weigh it all. Um, got kind of a bit messy, but it was fun. They had to weigh it all, like taking out of their recycle bins. And then there was a basic equation of that amount of plastic, how much CO2 was produced. And these kids were like having to redo it and redo it because they couldn't believe the amount of CO2s 
from just one week of plastic in the recycle bin that their household was producing. So again, you know, having that information, having that understanding, you know, these kids are now like advocating their parents, stop buying this, stop buying that, stop buying, you know, change happens. So, um, so you good. Know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. Little warriors. Yeah. I think we can, all, little warriors. we can all take a leaf out of that book. That's for sure. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, Sarah, just so, yeah, so grateful for the time today and um, for your time. And also, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just a joy to ch chat to you because obviously like you're, you're just a very pleasant and good person at heart as well which makes any conversation a lot easier. So, um, yeah, it's just so nice to connect and to hear about your story as well as all the work that you're doing. And, um, yeah, I, I have no doubt that we'll, we'll chat again in the future. But um, mm. for now, I just, yeah, thanks so much. Eh? Is there, well, um, and is there anything else you want to say before, you know, is there anything else that's, that, that you'd, like to, you'd like to put out there? No, I think, I mean, I just wanted to thank you too for, for listening to me and, um, and having, you know, a conversation with me. I think I'm like you, I'm very passionate about conversation um, and, and sharing conversation. I think it's great what you're doing. Um, I think, you know, again, you're sharing with your audience about what's important to you and why that's important um, and especially in the community that, that you spend a lot of time in, you know, with running and a lot of running in nature. Um, I, I just wanted to say to your community, you might not be ocean swimming, but there's um, it's very easy for you to, you know, take three for the for the forest when you're running through those beautiful natural um, spaces that you run through. But just you know, each and every one of us make those small changes. Tell people about it. You have incredible power to inspire others to do the same and and track it you know within your running communities um kind of form I guess little impact groups and work out the change that that you can have yourselves and feel really good about it you know that's I think for me that's my key message is you know we do live in a time where you can feel overwhelmed and you can feel like there's so much you should be doing but you're not doing it um we're all busy um but whatever you do um, if it's making a positive difference, a small action, genuinely feel good about it. I, you know, I can assure you when I do like a cleanup with CEOs of leading multinationals and they come down to Manly Cove Beach and they see that it's uh, at that particular time of morning before the council comes in every day, it is a total trash heap. It is obscene the amount of litter that's on our Sydney Harbour beaches before it's cleaned away, before we see it, and they get down there and these are like top CEOs of big multinationals, not little charities, and they clean up that beach and they are smiling from ear to ear because they know for that one moment they did a really good thing that will make a difference and they'll take that story back to their workplace and inspire you know, all of their teams to do the same. They'll change the culture in their workplace to stop using single-use plastics. They'll go down at a big fancy pants luncheon with other big fancy pants CEOs and tell them what they've done and that's how it all begins. And they feel really good about what they did and they should. And that's what I, the message I want is feel good about it. It doesn't matter what you do, even if it's really small and you stop using, you know, takeaway coffee cups feel good about it because it will make a difference. So awesome, yeah. Ah, so good. We are, and um, in trail running, we, we um, <laughs> it's funny, we actually, uh, we actually love to promote take, take Three for the Trail. Um, I've seen it. I checked you out. <laughs> oh, sweet, yeah. It's just, and it's so, it's so crazy. Just like um, I was actually in Cape Town in South Africa and I was running up Table Mountain. And I just kept coming across litter and litter and I was just running up there. And sometimes you just get in a flow, you get in a rhythm and, you, and, and you're not even running. All you're doing is kind of just like thinking, but in a really good kind of a thought pattern. And I was like, damn, I just, like, just got to throw together a little take three for the trail Instagram account and 
and just get people to start picking stuff up off the trail. And, um, yeah, you know, like it's it's amazing how many people actually do go, oh, yeah, I mean, makes sense. Like we're, we're, we spend so much time on the land, like this is where it's all coming from. We've got yeah. to we've got to clean up the land so it doesn't even make it to the make it to the um sea. It's just I almost thought it was way too simple that that people wouldn't like go, you know, wouldn't even care about it. But yeah, it's it's really it's really positive. And like, you know, it's it's just um just like you said, like raising it just a bit of awareness about it and stuff. So yeah, it's rad. Oh, it's absolutely awesome what you're doing and it's really important and and to your point, um, you know, I always say the simplicity of our message is our strength because it's achievable. And, you know, maybe you could maybe you could put out a range of um, take three of the trail backpacks that kind of fit nice and tight so that it doesn't interfere with the running to experience too much. And, um, you know, people can just get in the way and load her up. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is amazing how many conversations I've had with people that are like, we need to just make like a little bag that we can just like a little pocket that we can just stuff our rubbish in that, yeah. that it's just, but yeah, we've come out of, we've come out of some, you know, some pretty remote places with backpacks, like our running packs, just full of mm-hmm. bottles, full of cans. Like it's, it's crazy. I found, I went on a run yesterday, picked up two empty packets of cigarettes. Like they didn't even leave any ciggies in there for us, which is a mm-hmm. bit, you know, never happens, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, um, no, it's so it's so so good. Yeah. Um, but that's exactly how Take Three started. So hmm. you know the the um, one of our, our founders, well, both of our original founders, Mandy and Roberta, um, the the whole idea of okay, should we take ten, take fifteen, take twenty, take five? But take five was like a kids group, so they landed on Take Three because when you're coming out of the surf, you know, yeah. and you've got a board under your arm and you're trying to negotiate, you can't really pick up more than three pieces. Uh, so that kind of felt right. It's just take take that amount and then, if, you know, 50 surfers up the beach all do the same, then we're getting somewhere. Awesome. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's this conversation starter um, as well. But you guys, you know, we always encourage, we have this pick it up, snap it, share it campaign for Take 3, and that's what's in the 129 countries because there's people like pick it up, Take a photo, selfie. This is what we got. Share it, and that's how you raise awareness. And people, oh, I can do that. So good. So eh? it's fantastic. You know, I I just love what you're doing. I love the message that you're going out there, um, and it is actually really simple. It doesn't need to be complex. Mm. It's a complex problem, but if we're all just doing these simple things, um, and we all feel good about it, and uh, get out in nature and and just clean it up as you go. Yeah, such a got to get out there, don't you? You've got to get out there. Get get a Well, thank it. you so much. It's been great talking with you today, and um, you know, love what you do. Thank you for what you do. And um, maybe I'll, I'll catch you when one of your trails leads to the uh, leads to the ocean where I'm ocean swimming. <laughs> We've got plans. We've got plans for that. The two worlds will collide soon. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so Fantastic. much, Sarah. Thank you. Bye. So there we have it, a conversation with Sarah Beard, CEO of Take 3 for the Sea. If you'd like to find out more, please go check them out at take3.org or better yet, get involved. Next time you leave a waterway or the beach or anywhere and you see the opportunity to pick up three pieces of rubbish, do it, share it with Take 3 for the Sea. Make a difference, get involved because all these small things add up and uh, it's really going to make a big positive impact for the world we live in. So until next time, thanks so much for taking the time and energy to join us here at Stokely. And I hope you keep very, very well till next time. Thanks a lot.